name is Eric Mathis. Um, I am an assistant debate coach at Emory University. I am also the director of debate for uh, the Atlanta Urban Debate League Debate Ambassadors Program. And I have been tasked with talking to you all about critical approaches to the topic. I could probably talk about this all day, but I only have a limited time, so I cherry picked certain authors, certain critiques that I really want to talk about. And also talk to, you know, we have a few students. Raise your hand if you are new to debate. Raise your hand high. Where are my new ones? Yes. Round of applause for our new people to debate. <laughs> the goal of this is also to introduce them to critical approaches to debate. So if you come in here and you're like, Eric, I want to hear about this really weird case someone ran round two at Glenbrooks, I'm going to look at you and go, I later, please. If you're like Eric, I want to talk to you about this team that sung and danced. Uh, Chris Randall is the person you want to talk to. Chris Randall will love to hear all about that. All right? Come on in. Come on in. Hurry up. Uh, this also needs to be very interactive. If you have questions, ask. If you are unclear about something, ask. All right? This is not just going to be me talking for an hour and a half. There will be points of interaction. But we will cover a lot of subjects. Uh, we will discuss how to use sort of critical approaches both on the app and on the net. So for those who are like, Eric, I want to learn how to uh, debate a critical art or this critical art on the app, you may want to have uh, that uh, ready as a question as we go through some of the authors. Uh, we'll have a limited discussion on how to answer them. Uh, you all have great lab leaders. Those lab leaders will be willing and able to help answer these arguments if we don't go in depth on how to answer them. This will not, however, be an introduction to the critique. I'm not going over the parts of a K. I'm not going over the structure of K or how to deploy the K. I am only dealing with the literature base itself. Is that clear? Good? All right. I, I sort of subdivided this into two types of critiques. Structural critiques uh, and uh, critiques of identity. We'll go over them in depth. I think I sort of like did my slides out of order, but you'll be able to follow along. So the first one I really want to talk about uh, is neoliberalism. And so what we need is a working definition of what neoliberalism is. A tool, can you see that? You're okay? All right. Does anybody can't see that? Is everybody okay? My people in the back who should sit up further because there are seats up here. Can you see that? Yeah. Thank you. All right. Can I get someone to read uh, this particular uh, article? Who wants to read that for me? Yes, sir, in the middle. All right. Hold on, who's it from? Who's it from? Oh, it's from uh, Stanley Fish in 2009. Uh, neoliberalism and higher education is the best of the humanities. What I've learned in what some leaders of this column know about, already knew, is that neoliberalism is a good word in a way of referring to a set of economical slash or economic slash political policies based on a I like this definition. It sort of sums up a lot of the reasons for why neoliberalism tends to be uh, a, one of the more powerful and generic critiques on the top. Neoliberalism is an ethic unto itself. What that means is, is that there is only the market that matters. Nothing else matters beyond the preservation of the market. It also acts as a guide for how human beings are to act. You will hear a lot of people when they discuss neoliberalism, they will say that neoliberalism orients the way in which humans interact with one another. What it means is that it dictates those interactions, those conversations, the means, purpose, and guides for those particular interactions. If everything is premised on the preservation of the market, other things are not ethical within that decision calculus. So for example, right, uh, if an individual is deemed by the market incapable of, of potentially benefiting the market, that person can then be seen as deviant to the particular market. Neoliberal violence 
is very important to critical literature because what ultimately ends up happening is most other criticisms all reference the fact of neoliberal violence. So if you are affirmative, for example, and you are able to dictate how your app challenges neoliberalism, you could probably go a very, very long way in addressing a lot of critiques. And we'll sort of go through some of those critiques and you'll see how neoliberalism uh, comes back into play. So there are a few people I want to talk about when it comes to neoliberalism. Uh, one is uh, Henry Giraud. Uh, we'll talk about the relevance of neoliberalism to the topic. And we'll also talk about a gentleman by the name of Pablo Freire. In between that, we'll talk about someone you may have heard of, a man by the name of Baudrillard. Time. I said Bulger, everybody went, ooh. <laughs> Finally, can you make sense of the things that people do? No, I cannot. I don't know why they do that. Uh, so, Henry Giraud was a reader of Pablo Freire. He believes that current education has undergone a radical shift. And that radical shift explains particularly that changing of the path of things being a public good to merely benefiting the market. So remember the definition we sort of talked about a little bit earlier, right? That neoliberalism only cares about the market in and of itself. Because he is a follower of Freire, Freire excuse me, he is concerned with the failings of traditional education. Pablo Freire was a gentleman who talked about the radical ways in which we need to reorient or change the way education is taught uh, in, well, in Brazil, which is where he's from. But Giraud took that a step further and said, we need to look at the way that that is done in places like America and abroad as well. He said that education was bigger than merely being competitive with, uh, being trying to be competitive with the U.S. and China. Giraud believed that when we are constantly educating human beings, we are constantly trying to get them to be productive members throughout the marketplace. We are not trying to make them citizens who can be productive, who can dissent or challenge the status quo. And so I have this card to sort of highlight that uh, from, uh, uh, from Jerome himself. Uh, who wants to read this one for me? Yes, sir. Lessons you learned from Paul Freire as education is being taken over by the mega rich by When we survey the current state of education in the United States, we see that most universities are now dominated by instrumentalist and conservative ideologies, hooked on methods slavishly wedded to the accountability measures and run by administrators who often lack a broader vision of education as a force for strengthening civic imagination and expanding democratic public of life. One consequence is that a concern of excellence has been removed from matters of equity while higher education conceptualized as a fundamental public good has been reduced to a private good, now available almost exclusively to those with financial needs. Universities are increasingly defined in corporate demand to grow of skills, knowledge, and credentials, and building a workforce that will enable the United States to compete against blockbuster growth in China and other Southeast Asian markets, while maintaining its role as the major or global economic and military power. There is little interest in understanding the pedagogical foundation of higher education is a deeply civic and political project that provides the conditions for individual autonomy, and takes liberation, and the practice of freedom as a collective Freedom. So given this backdrop, Jerome has spent a lot of time, significant period of time, drawing from his connections between market forces, shaping uh, how we develop children throughout history, and also sort of the ways in which U.S. competition with China. What Jerome is making the claim here is that the markets merely see its competition with China as the ultimate goal that needs to be conquered. Nothing else matters. There's no other ethic, no other violence that necessarily uh, needs to be discussed, only the preservation of the market. Here's a separate card that I think sort of speaks to the way in which uh, neoliberalism plays in education. And I think it's a pretty decent link card when it comes to this year's topic. Uh, it's from Jerome himself. Uh, it's from truthout.org. Uh, it says neoliberalism, da, 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 da. neoliberalism subordinates democratic education to barbaric calculations on the market that renders children disposable interests in the service of profit. 
Jerome and Nana. By the way, truthout.org is a great place if you want to find a lot of Jerome literature. Right? We'll have links that will be dispersed throughout, but Jerome writes a lot there. He says, there is an issue of what kind of public space and values we want to make available for children to learn the knowledge, skills, and experience they need. In a society that measures success and failure solely through the economic lens of GDP, it becomes difficult to define youth outside of the market principle. So here we go again. We are only defining children's value in the context of the market, as Jerome is pointing out. Determined largely by criteria such as the rate of market growth, the accumulation of capital, the value and worth of young people in the discourse are largely determined through the bottom line. Cost-benefit categories of income, expense, access, and liability. American youth are commercially carpet bombed through a never-ending proliferation of market strategies that colonize their daily lives. Uh, colonize yeah, their lives. Multi-billion corporations become the primary educational and cultural force in shaping, if not hijacking, how young people define their interests, values, relations to others. A lot of the things that you will hear when it comes to criticisms on the education topic is the way in which education defines, produces subjects or individuals for the real world. Except for Bojar. We'll get there, I promise. Jerome thinks that this is problematic because if we only focus on the market as being the determination of good and evil, it is easy to define deviant human beings in that particular framework. If an individual is incapable of producing a higher profit margin, that person is not disposable. You'll hear people, not, I'll say this, bad teachers, who say, if you continue to act like this, you'll never get a job in this country. That sort of rhetoric reorients an individual from whether or not they are deviant or, or productive. Now, there could be reasons for why that person may be acting that way. That person could have a particular condition. They may have sneezed wrong. They may not have gotten coffee. Like, I didn't get coffee because no one here brought me coffee. No one. Uh, all right. At least someone brought me water. Thanks, all. So, us them dichotomies show, up, show themselves when it comes to neoliberalism. Are you for or against the market? There's a, and it, there's a de-schooling critique that is out. Uh, the de-schooling critique, which I don't know is, I don't believe is part of the core packet, but will be deployed later, is functionally just a capitalism, neoliberalism argument. Not that big of a difference. If you can understand sort of the context of what neoliberalism is, you should be able to deploy the de-schooling argument. It just basically says that uh, the, sorry, is that Cambridge Man writing basically? Oh, the link argument is, that neoliberalism has infected education or it upholds neoliberal values. This happens because of the ways in which teachers teach curriculum and try to produce students who can get better jobs in the future, i.e. the market. That is it. Now, is that a universal truth? Probably not. But that is the story that has been told. You'll also notice, and this is just a side note, a lot of critiques will argue that teachers themselves are the ones who are at the sort of front line of sort of the unethical behavior that may be going on in schools themselves. And so when we think about a critique, we have to understand that a critique, some of you may know, some of you may not, is a way we bring structural criticism into the debate. And so it is a it crown challenges the worldview of the 1AC. So in the context of the school, the teachers are teaching unethical behaviors, the students learn unethical behaviors, those students then become unethical subjects. And that is the basis of most, if not all, educational critiques on this topic. All right. Bojard. So John Bojard is a man you may have heard of. He has uh, become very, very prominent in debate uh, for a variety of reasons. There was a team in college that deployed a certain type of argument, and then sadly, other teams tried to copy that and were not as successful, were not as good. Part of the reason is that they don't really understand Bojar. I thought about multiple ways in which I could try to talk to you all about Bojar, but I found this really good clip, I think, that sort of summarizes uh, a lot of what is going on when it comes to Bojar. So I want to play this clip. It is from a uh, philosopher. We'll describe his name here in a minute. So what I want, everybody can see that? All right. What I want is for you to listen up 
There will be questions that will be very, very debate relevant. Uh, and there will also be reasons for why Bolger theory is flawed, i.e. answer to the Bolger critique. Those listen up. <coughs> Italian restaurant. 
And we don't demur. We don't say, no, that's all untrue. We just take it for granted, yeah, that's what it means. It's an Italian restaurant. And it's that kind of slippage between the real and the imagined, or the true and the fictional, which Baudrillard is becoming increasingly characteristic of um, class as something goes on. He's also known for saying that the Gulf War never happened. What does he mean by that? Well, much the same thing, that although we're talking here about the 1980s Gulf War, um, and he wrote three essays, um, if I can recall them, which appeared in a Paris newspaper. The Gulf War will not happen. The Gulf War is not happening. And finally, the Gulf War did not happen. Needless to say, this irked the French public quite considerably, as, as they were involved in that particular war. Um, the argument, in the broadest sense, is that because our experience of the world has now been so thoroughly destabilized by the media, that it's almost impossible to say what is really, really going on. You can certainly have lots of different competing accounts of what goes on. And in Britain, I can remember John Snow having a, having a map on the ground of the studio where he would move tanks and bodies around to describe what was happening at the time. Um, but the reality of what was really going on, of course, was quite unknown to us. We only experienced it through very long periods of broadcast time given over to that particular war. Um, he's not, and I think this is a mistake that some students could make, he's not saying that the media distort reality, because there is no real left to distort. There are simply competing rhetorics or ways of talking about things, competing versions, competing simulations of reality, which are designed increasingly to seduce us, but which doesn't mean sexually seduced, it means that they seduce us in, in the sense that they become convincing for us. We believe those, even though there's no reference or real object out there to which they're referring. I also think that his assumption that the real and the fictional collapsed into each other um, is, is quite misleading. And one could demonstrate this, I think, with another anecdote. In the late 1990s, uh, Coronation Street, the famous soap, had one of its well known characters, Deirdre Barlow, was sent to jail. Um, I remember watching the FA Cup final on TV that year, and there was a big placard saying, Free Deirdre Barlow! And lo and behold, I heard on Radio 4, somebody in the House of Commons and asked the Home Secretary if he was looking at the Deirdre Barlow case, because it was clearly unjust that she was in jail. Everybody had a good laugh. You could laugh at the football, you could laugh at the, uh, you could laugh at the House of Commons, and that moment. It, was, it was all good fun. But jokes only work if you know the distinction between the real and the fictional. In fact, jokes in many ways are where different levels of, if you like, reality collide with each other, which was on the same level, but in fact they belong in quite different places. And um, he seems quite happy just to assume that agents are mashed into this um, hyper-real world where the simulation is more real than the real. Is there anything else that you'd like to say about Adrian's ideas? Um, only that I think people should be sceptical of them, in the sense that you, you should not get overwhelmed by thinking they must be frightfully interesting because they're so difficult to understand. I think that's a danger. We become rather submissive in the face of what he has to say. Um, on the other hand, simply shrugging your shoulders and saying, I don't know anything about this, it's all nonsense. I think we could miss out quite a chunk of stuff that is, is, uh, is, 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 is rich in ideas and possibilities. Um, and ironically, I think, in the United States, what I've said, much of what he has to say about mass culture does sit, does seem to apply to aspects of our lives in, in surprising ways. Thank you very much. All right.
So, I want to break down a couple things in the video uh, because I think it may help sort of crystallize a couple of key points, right? So, what is Simulacrum? What did it say in the video? Someone tell me. Yes. simulations, right? So there are tons of simulations. Yes, sir. Each simulation is a society's perception of what reality is. Yes. So a great example of that is Trump does X, CNN says one thing, Fox says another. Which one is true? Do not yell it out. All right. But the point is, is that there, those are competing interpretations of reality. They are conflicting and in competition with one another. And somebody fell. But so we do not know which is real. Uh, there was a hand up over here. Uh, was there a hand up? Hand up? Hand up? All right. So, Baudrillard says that simulacra is sort of the way in which the media represents and replicates the real. They, sim they create simulations. Baudrillard's or theory says that truth should always be deconstructed. We should always challenge what we think the truth is. Right? As the uh, professor here said, there is no real in the world of Bolgiard, just a bunch of simulations. So we should critique those things. <coughs> There's a couple of examples that sort of want to crystallize. It's a little dated. Uh, how many people in here have seen the Godfather movie? Alright? So we have a few people who've seen the Godfather movie, right? So for those who don't do not understand, the Godfather was a uh, a gangster film done even before I was born, uh, and it starred a very, very famous actor, Marlon Brando. I won't, Brando, I won't spoil the ending or anything, but his point is, is that because of that movie, we tend to think that that was what an Italian person looked like, act like, sounded like, and it had filtered all, or filtrated all the way to England in an Italian shop where there was a sign of Marlon Brando standing or sitting in a chair. And for Bolger, this was how the, how the media simulates the real. And it becomes sort of the new truth. People tend to believe the movie that that is what an Italian individual looks like, talks like, and acts like. And he says that that slippage between the real and the imaginary or the simulation is extraordinarily problematic. But go for it didn't happen. Someone tell me a little bit what he said about the Gulf War. <coughs> yes. Like, Say it louder, louder. Like, was it arguing that it was meant to be a place that just said it wasn't a war? Right. One of the tenets, and that's, not, that's a good point, that didn't really get explained as well, is both of argument was this was not a war. A war generally is like two countries or multiple countries engaged in a prolonged conflict. The Gulf War was more so of a beatdown. Uh, for those who are fighting against uh, Iran. Iraq? Yeah. Iraq. Iraq, thanks. And he said this wasn't a war. But because the way in which we simulated it, i.e. making it seem like it was more of a war, it seduced individuals into things like patriotism, into things like I want to join the military, and I wanted to support U.S. Edge, all those things, because we were uh, assumed that we were under siege. Yes, sir. We should always challenge the simulation. Is it because you find and rediscover the real? Or does it feel never exist? What, what, why should we challenge it? Say the last part again. Um, you said, what, what should we challenge it? You said, why should we why, why is it saying we should challenge it? So the reason that uh, Bolger believes that we should challenge simulacra or the simulation is to expose the fact that it is a simulation, that it is not real. And that it is seducing us in a way in which it is violent and very destructive. Hold on one second. There's a general record with the glass in the back. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, so we talked about uh, real as a distortion. Um, uh, Bogart is talking about how the media, the media is the actor of all the sorts. So not the media or all the sorts. You never have really happened. Um, and so you tell them. Check it. Is he saying that the media is the sole reason why all the sorts happen? For, for the purposes of things like the Gulf War and other things, yes, the media is sort of the source of that. Yes. Yes, sir. So, you were just saying no reality. Just 
Bolger believes that we have sort of entered this hyperreal where the simulation is now the constant real. So in the world of Bolger, he's like, there is no real. The way in which we communicate things, we interact with things, are nothing more but a representation of the simulation. Now, that sort of seems odd because I'm standing in front of you all right now. I'm sort of real. But his argument is sort of a little bit deeper than that. It is that, imagine, the question he would ask is, how do you know what that gentleman said about Bolger is real? He just happened to say that he's a professor, he's on a video, and he's being played to you. He said, that could be a simulation of my theory, or it could not be. But because he sounds convincing, you all are now typing on your laptops, writing your sheets of paper, believing that that is the theory of Bolger. And Bolger would say, that is the problem, because we have not deconstructed whether or not that is true or false. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Uh, one second. Yes. Hold on. Who's I can't see who's talking about. Oh, thanks. Uh, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I think in the clip itself, uh, it, I think he does lend credence to the fact that Bolger believes that at some point in time the media sort of interacted or sort of changed the way in which we can interact with the real. And so no longer is there a real. There may have been a time when there was a real, uh, but it is something that no longer is in existence. Uh, yes, sir, in the back, put the glass in the headphones. Did you have your hand up? Oh, no, yes. Okay, sweet. Yes, sir. Louder. How do we know both of our is real? Sure. I mean, these are all sort of like circular type questions, I suppose. Right? Wait, if you debated him, you wouldn't know he was real? <laughs> Is that what you said? <laughs> sure, all those things kind of come into question. Right, if you're an affirmative, that may be a point you would like to make, right? Uh, Bojard will probably articulate that uh, his method of communication sort of distorts the simulation because he's, he's deconstructing the truth, which is not a tenet of the simulation. The simulation's job is not to deconstruct the truth. So he probably will rely on that particular tenet. Uh, close it to Hannah. Yes? Like, what is like, the idea that we have? Hmm. I don't know. Maybe. There are definitely people that say that like Bojar's logic is a bit circular. That how do we ever escape the simulation? Like the deconstruction in and of itself could be a simulation. We could be deconstructing the wrong simulation and get to the wrong truth. Right? That is a problematic uh, fundamental issue when it comes to Bojar. That's a fair point. Yes? Ah, uh, now we're getting to debate rhetoric. Is there an alternative to Bolgiar? <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know. I haven't really heard a great uh, articulation. You'll hear a lot of debaters say things like, oh, we're going to accelerate the form of communication to destroy the sort of real. I don't know what that does. It seems that the acceleration is already occurring if you listen to what Bolgiar is saying. We've already entered the hyper real. What, what do we enter next? Right? Well, the internet could be another simulation of the hyper real that is the super hyper real. Or super hyper real 3 if you're a Dragon Ball Z fan. <laughs> or super Saiyan God real. I don't know. Right? No one knows. Right? That, that is one of the sort of the issues with sort of Bojar is this sort of like ability to sort of determine how do we destroy all simulations and revert back to the truth. Do we destroy the media? I don't know if that gets us there. Uh, do we write things on our palm? Do we point at things? Do we do all this crazy stuff? And we say, before I ask you a question, I have a question. If you were a circle and a bird, what area code would you live in? None of that seems to distort anything. And if anything, I'm more confused. Right? So the alternative component of that is uh, very, very tricky. Yes, sir? Oh, uh, loud. 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 Because for his theory to be true, it has to assume that his theory is a real. However, he himself admits that everything is a simulation of the human person to do. So therefore, his theory is both true and false at the same time, which is rather confusing to the theory of the true and true and false. And even with them, it, since it can achieve the success of both true and false at the same time, therefore, it's almost a paradox. 
Yeah, that's the total like circular logic of Baudrillard's theory, right? Baudrillard, in several pieces of literature himself, says that he has also fallen into the trap of like the hyperlink. That he has fallen into the trap of commodification, which I'll talk about here in a second, right? So Baudrillard himself is analyzing and trying to deconstruct the truth, but does he ever get to a way of getting there or finalizing it? Hard to say. Uh, a couple more questions, and I want to move on. Uh, I've heard from you. Let me see. Anybody over here? <coughs> yes. And then I'll go to the back. Uh, I think both are probably, I don't know about the, what the destruction of the state looks like, so that sort of begs one particular question. Uh, I don't think that like the extermination of all things is something that, advocate, that Bojar uh, himself sort of advocated. He did believe that we should sort of deconstruct or tear down sort of the myth of the truth and the real. Now, what that entails, I don't know. Now, there are several authors who will say, who will piggyback off of what Bojar said and said we should deconstruct the notion of the state, or we should deconstruct or destroy the media, or we should deconstruct conservatism or capitalism, because Bojar uh, read a lot of like Marxism, right? So there's a lot of things that people can sort of take as tenants to do that, but it is debatable whether or not those things will be successful or even things that you will ultimately have here. Uh, blue shirt, and then here, and then in the back, and then I'll move on. Why is the real necessarily Why is the real better than the simulation? It sounds like the movie The Matrix. <laughs> uh, I think for, for Bolgiar, wait, hold on. You said why is the real better? Yeah. Uh, for Bolgiar, I, I, I would probably argue that he said that the truth is something that everyone should know, that you should not live the lie uh, that seduces you into sort of like capitalist commodification. And the truth is the only way to sort of break away from that fantasy. The illusion of hope, progress, etc are all trapped in this hyper-reality. So the truth is always better because you should not be commodified. Now, if you enjoy being commodified and you're like in the mainstream, like this steak tastes good, I like making money, I like being the next rapper, I like, I don't want to be the next rapper, but if you want to do that, sure. Maybe you want to be a big fidget spinner or something, I don't know. Right? Right? If you enjoy the seduction, then sure, that might be an impact turn to the bullshit. You're like, you know what, this truth is nonsense. This data simulation is pretty good. My parents got a nice house. Uh, who, who has their hand up over here? There's a question? Okay. So most of the people about the truth, yes. Uh, in the back, no, I can't see what hand is up. Yes, right there. Cut your thought. Does um, Bojo specify the origin of the simulation and like because media is part of society, which they naturally would have the origin or would it be like... He spends a lot of time talking about the media as sort of the source. So I would probably, uh, I would probably look there. I don't know if there's anything else that predated the media that started to produce or to, uh, destroy or simulate uh, simulation. Uh, Solomon and Dan over here. What is the real? What is the real? Okay. The truth? What, what is that? What is the truth in Bourdieu's world? I am not sure. I'll be frank. frank. I am not sure. I don't, I'm not really sure what Bourdieu says at the time, to be honest with you. He confuses me a lot. <laughs> Last question. Ah, yes. How is Bolger relevant? Oh, hold on. Hold that question because we're going to talk about that in a second, okay? One second. I did want to finish up on the last couple of quick things, right? He talked about criticisms of Bolger. If you are debating Bolger, one of the things you need to remember, he said things like what? Like jokes prove that there has not been a collapsing of the simulation and the real. Right, there's no, the hyper reality is not accelerating, collapsing upon itself. The fact that I can distinguish between two things indicates that those things being true. If you are reading your affirmative, for example, you need to defend that your ad is real. That our authors are true, are, have researched this, done tons of work, and they know what they're talking about. You're not replicating that sort of simulation. So, someone asks, what is the relevancy to the debate topic? This is from uh, Anita Cherry, I think, is that right? Who is sort of drawing on Bojar's connection between uh, schools and their particip uh, participation in simulacra. Uh, somebody read that for me. 
Yes. School performances are constructed as a set of market imaginary. The illusion of learning in school is as fun is sold to potential students. Performance is a race the experience of their spectators, their experiencing of the real, lived world, the boring, demanding process of learning, schooling, and the spectators. Thus, within the simulacra, they did the deconstructed education for their children on the basis of simulated images rather than the basis of representation of any kind of reality. That is a smaller quote, a sort of a larger art argument uh, that Anita is making. What Anita is making is that, and, and possibly other theorists on this particular topic, is that uh, who use Baudrillard will say two things. The first is that school itself is fixation on this performance, that school is this enjoyable, nice process where you play outside every day and you just have fun, you meet new friends, and you grow up and you be best buds forever, is a lot. How many people? How many people were like, when you got to kindergarten, it's like, man, this is sweet. And then you got to like 10th grade, and you're like, what in the world are all these AP classes? Yes, all of you all have taken like too many AP classes. Right? That is part of the simulation. Your parents and everyone was seduced by the story of schooling in the context of that school actually is trying to drive and protect and, and, and insulate, or what's a better word than that? Propagate. That works. The market. Right? Remember neoliberalism. <coughs> Everything is for the preservation of the market. The performance of the school is seducing the student and more importantly the parents into the simulacra, into the uh, market, and into the, uh, the hyperreal. That is the angle that I believe that most people will utilize Bolgiar. Now, you will have people who do the weird thing of like, I will talk in odd sentences, truth, where, now, who, when. Distortion, Bolgiard, scene, ad, what? I don't know what you mean. <laughs> Talk English, I don't know. Right? But if you were to read evidence and you're trying to connect the tenets of the ad, I think this is a great way to do so. Uh, the second part, I think I kind of covered this, uh, was that, student, that the schooling operates as a locker because schooling plays sort of on the real estate. Yes, one, two, three. Oh, the second component of that is that the 1AC sort of aids schooling in its ability to produce the performance. A lot of apps will say things like school failing, one second, uh, school's failing, schools need help, school needs X, right? They will say that your participation in aiding the school aids the simulation. That you are furthering the inability for people to step outside of schooling and deconstruct the truth of schooling. Does that make sense? All right. Yes, sir. This is just a sort of a springing along the uh, idea of an argument that we can have to our tears when we know that there is an experience in our head. So I just sort of think that this entire thing is just a way uh, to puppet. I mean, not really puppet anything, but more just a way to create a whole new theory based on the idea that there is a theory. The sure. That could be true. So really, all this is. It's a, I mean, it's, a, it's argued properly, it's almost impossible to truly argue against this because it's just a simple admission that that's true. No, it's not an impossible to argue against. There's no, if there's no such thing as truth, then there's no such thing as the impossibility to argue against something. That's fair. Right? You can just simply say, look, this may be true, but not all schooling seduces kids into thinking that every day is going to be kindergarten. <coughs> that the purpose of our school is not only to teach our students how to get a job in the future, but also to become like rational subjects to deconstruct and challenge things. School is not this monolithic construct. And this goes back to the video when uh, people tend to take Bojar's arguments a little bit too far and beyond the steps of me. Uh, yes, sir, in the back. Oh, louder. That might be a tactic. That might be an alternative, yes. Right. If your argument is that if we destroy sort of the imagination and the belief in the market, then we can destroy the simulation, that could be a pathway uh, of an alternative of fixing or challenging the simulation. Yes. Yes. Right. 
I know I know Kevin Hart is a comedian. I know that nine times out of ten, if not ten times out of ten, he's telling a joke. He had a show that was called The Real Housewives or Real Husbands of Hollywood. Who, who's watched that show by chance? Right? Do, do any of you all, this is harder, here's a great field test. I'm coming to you in a second. You three have watched this show, yes? Do any of you think that's true? That is proof that the hyper real is not fixed. That everything is not simulated to the simulation. I can determine the truth. If someone says something that is illogical, I can determine that it is illogical. Like fish spinners are cool. That is, that is an objective truth. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. But I give back what you're saying. No, 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 Sorry. This is why I talk about both your my house and these kind of problems. No, but the argument you want to make is, is that the fact that jokes are funny and jokes work is because we are able to distinguish sort of the fake from the real or the truth. Right? That distinction proves that. And then you can make other arguments about reasons for why your authors would not probably engage in a simulation that was unethical because, you know, they get them fired or something along those lines. Okay? Uh, in the back, and I'm coming front. Yes? Uh, I can't. Sorry. Isn't your basis for logic to contrast the illogic of the joke still based in the simulation? Like, Potentially. I think that's what a Bolger team would say. But I think the, the problem with that is, is that under Bolger's tenets, everything should be the hyperreal, the simulation, the non-truth. But if I can determine that Kevin Hart's TV show is not real, then that should be able to determine that there is a simulation and then there is a real or a truth. And I can distinguish the truth. Right? It is debatable, but that is the tenet of the argument. Uh, yes? So, does Bozer also talk about how like, little kids are like, made to be caught with the I don't know if like... Uh, wait, say the last word again. Is, like, is that more like a Jerome thing? Like, say the whole thing again, sorry. So, does Baudrillard talk about little kids specifically, like, in case of litigation, like the Toronto talked about, being, like, taught to believe that they have to be, like, a productive member in the marketplace? Or is that more? There's some overlap between the two. I think both of them sort of talk about Jerome more than Baudrillard. A lot of people will take Baudrillard's sort of theories and apply them to certain other topics because it's not like Baudrillard covered all these sort of things. He just more so fixated on media, representation, market, etc. Giraud definitively talks about education because of the way in which he was raised and educated and followed Pablo Freire. So they will overlap some, uh, yes, uh, but if you're looking for someone that speaks more about education, I will focus on that. Uh, yes, sir. <coughs> yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, sorry. Um, even if uh, the media has some like, perception of our reality, Who's to say like that that totally causes the shift from like things being a simulation and things not being real? Like how could you ever How could we ever prove? Yeah. Like prove. like if you like if I saw something happen in front of my eyes, like would, is there any way to like tell like if something's real? I think that I think that's sort of what the professor gets at is like when we sort of take this a little bit too far and question everything we sort of see, it becomes extraordinarily dangerous, right? This justifies things like there were cards last year uh, on the uh, election for the election uh, this day, right? There were cards that said that the reason that a lot of people voted for Donald Trump, this is not an indict of Donald Trump.